Today, we will investigate how we navigate the track while avoiding crashing into static obstacles. You previously learned about a simple algorithm called wall following to drive straight and lap around in a loop. Wall following essentially track the left or the right-hand side boundaries using a 2D LiDAR scan. And then you could drive well in an open track. As always, this course is a team effort with contributions from a variety of individuals. We are grateful for learning from each other. Take this track over here. It has a variety of static obstacles on the path of the car. So naive approach of just tracking the left or the right side boundary is not going to be an efficient way of navigating. You might still get the car to avoid some of these obstacles by just tracking the profile of the boundaries of these obstacles, but this will break down quickly for your wall following algorithms. Let's say we start following the right-hand side of the wall where the car is at the bottom and we get past the first two boxes. The challenge then is that these obstacles are of different shapes and there are gaps between them, like between those two cylinders over there, between these consecutive obstacles. So your car might actually go inside one of these gaps if it's just following the right-hand wall. Similarly, if you're following the left-hand wall <clears throat> and there are other parts of the course where the obstacles are both on the left side and on the right-hand side. So you have to sort of thread the needle and go between that gap. And then immediately right after that, you have to avoid an obstacle that's right in the middle of the path. And you have to go around and figure out which side to go around one of these obstacles as well. So one way that we could navigate this environment is to build a map of this environment using say an occupancy grid like Hector Slam or Cartographer that we learn about later. Then there are multiple steps that you have to go through once you build a map using SLAM. First, you have to use a motion planning algorithm, say, such as Pure Pursuit, which we will also cover in following lectures, and follow a predetermined path, which avoids any collisions and clears any obstacles. So you know where the obstacles are, you basically know the whole map before you get onto the track. And then you have to run a trajectory tracking algorithm to control the actuation of your steering and your velocity to adhere to the trajectory that you have planned with this pure pursuit path. So now that's a quite a bit of you know, uh, effort to put in and you also have to kind of traverse this path before you actually traverse it for real in a race, uh, which is not gonna happen. So when we are working in chaotic environments or environments which we haven't been to, uh, we wanna know, you know how can we preserve this reactive nature of wall following you know, type of approaches uh, where, which are map free and they don't require a lot of information from the track to begin with. Uh, so we call this a map free reactive approach to navigation. And as you're basically making your decisions on how to la do lateral or longitudinal control based on what your perception data reads right now and not really having any history or a priori map to begin with. So very, very simple, just reacting to what you're seeing right now. So uh, <clears throat> through this uh, lecture, we'll prepare for essentially building this obstacle avoidance uh, algorithm over here called follow the gap. And then the learning outcomes that we will have are learning the basics of reactive navigation, building upon wall following, uh, but for obstacle avoidance of both dynamic and we'll see to what extent we can do it for dynamic, uh, uh, static and dynamic obstacles. And so following this lecture, you will be uh, doing a lab where you will actually implement this in simulation uh, called the follow with the gap lab. And then you will actually do this on the real vehicle. So here you can see this is a real vehicle traversing through a bunch of obstacles and navigating very swiftly through the corridor over here. And you will actually implement that on the actual F110 car. So in case you are curious, you know, is this even like an effective way? It looks like a kind of a very fragile way of navigating, but you know, we are in a closed track. So that already kind of makes it a simpler environment to navigate to. There aren't choices of going, you know, in the left path or the right path. And we want to sort of get to do some global planning in that sense. So here's a, let me play this clip from a few years ago. This was from the F110 competition that, we ha that was held in Portugal back in 2017. And so you, you can see the onboard footage of how fast the car is driving. And notice that, you know, they're not doing wall following because every time the car makes a turn, it actually goes straight in 
and doesn't adjust itself to the center line because the track is actually curved. So we're not following the profile of the wall, but instead we're doing something better by driving faster along the straights and then slowing down you know, uh, as we take tight curves. If you're able to hear the audio, which is quite faint over here, as it's playing along, you can hear the velocity of the car is also increasing and decreasing based on how sharp the curve is. And now it's going through the straight and then it basically speeds up through that part. So here's the big question of the day, you know, how do we get to that level of performance without a map? So just pause for a second, pause the video for a second over here and think about how you would do that. And then we can see, uh, you know, a way of how we're going to do that together over here. So let's see with this follow the gap uh, effort is the first example algorithm that we will use. And then we will look at a variation of this. These are all heuristic approaches uh, because they are just greedy approaches. We're just working with what we know at the current moment and trying to make the best of that situation. And then we'll also, we'll look at the disparity extender, which is a, a variation of this and has also shown to be uh, quite effective in racing. <clears throat> and then we'll very briefly look at other reactive approaches uh, such as the bug algorithms and uh, 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 other ways of, you know, using potential fields uh, to navigate through these kind of unknown environments. And finally, we'll wrap up with, you know, what you would do for your Ross lab for follow the gap. So let's get started, right? So take a look at this LIDAR point cloud from the car's perspective, right? On the y-axis are the distances in meters of how far the LIDAR rays have returned from the obstacles. And on the x-axis is the field of view from zero to pi. So we are basically projecting what the ROS LiDAR array has returned back to you. So you can pause, you know, so now essentially based on just this snapshot in time, in what heading on what direction should the car drive, right? So you can pause this video right here and try to come up with guesses as to where do you think this car should be going and where do you think it should not be going, right? So, Looking at the point cloud, we see that there are some obstacles that are very close to the LIDAR on the, the right over here, right? So we have a, a close object uh, and, uh, and then there are some that are right in front of the car. And obviously we won't be going in this data uh, direction between say 1.1 to about 1.5 radians. And neither do we want to go to anything between say 1.75 to about 2.5, right? That means that the obstacles are right in front of us. And if you look at the range reported between like zero to 1.1, uh, then you see that there's, you know, not an immediate obstacle, but there are some curved objects within a meter, right? So at 1.5 radians, there is an obstacle, which is about two meters away. And if we can go through this gap, we know that is a clear path, you know, until an, uh, you know, the obstacle is right up there, right? So, so this might be some, there might be something behind that obstacle, which is occluded right now. We can't be sure for now because we only have a 2D scan um, and we can't look through the object. And so this now seems that there is room, you know, if there's room for the car to drive, then there's at least two meters before it encounters this obstacle and then it can make decisions following that. And the same can be said for the obstacle between 2.5 to 3.1 uh, radians. This is a slightly wider gap. So you may be able to turn into that uh, based on your current pose that you can actually move into that region, right? So this gives us an idea of, you know, how we need to parse the LiDAR readings to determine, you know, what should be the correct heading for the car for it to avoid imminent collisions. And so if you're following along with that idea, it's basically, the heart of the follow the gap algorithm is going to be, right? So, so let's, you know, make a toy version of the same problem. Let's say your car, you know, is at, at, at some point in time, this is the range vector that the LiDAR reports. And so for simplicity's sake, we just have the range vector of just 12 values shown here. So the question again becomes, you know, if this is the information that you receive at each timestamp, then which direction should you be heading with your car? So there are actually quite a few candidates, you know, that you might want to drive towards. The inf is for infinity, by the way, is just the LIDAR's way of saying that that ray was sent in that particular direction and there was no reflection coming back. So there's no obstacle within the maximum distance of the LIDAR 
can sense in that particular angular direction, right? So for some of the LIDARs we use, that's about 10 meters away. So for 10 meters, you basically have a clear path. So this means that, you know, the direction to this infinity is the furthest you can drive and there would be no obstacle present, right? So that looks like a good candidate to begin with. But think about why this may not be a good candidate, right? So if you look at the range vector closely, what you'll find is that even though technically there wasn't an obstacle reported, there are close obstacles reported in the vicinity, right? There's a three on and the three on the other side. So within three meters, you have two obstacles that are very close to each other. Uh, so in other words, even though this particular ray has reported an absence of an object, uh, we need to avoid two adjacent obstacles that are just three meters ahead in order for us to successfully pass through this direction, right? So the ray passes through, but it's not necessarily that the car you know, which is of a much larger dimension than a ray can pass through, right? So you can compute the, you know, length of the arc three meters away given this angular measurement. And so even though, you know, we can choose the first distance, it might not always be the best choice to make. So which gap should we follow then? So we need a better definition first of what is a gap, right? So one way of defining what a gap is to look for a series, you know, of at least say n consecutive values, each of which are at least a threshold distance d away, so that we can define some threshold, say five meters, right? So let's define a gap as a sequence of at least three values that are at least five meters away. So we can identify gap one now, which is a sequence of length four, uh, and then a gap two, which is a sequence of length three on the right-hand side, right? So, and, and both are reasonably large gaps, they're above our thresholds. So what, you know, what follow the gap does now is that it drives towards the center of the widest available gap. And that's the direction it's going to take at this point in time. So that's the algorithm in a nutshell, right? So we may, we may have many different ways of figuring out what a gap is in our range uh, by changing these thresholds. And then we can choose between candidate gaps and figure out what gap should we should go towards. Whatever we decide, we usually go towards the center of the widest gap. In some cases, you will see that we also go towards the longest range reported within that gap. That makes sense because we just want to go as far as possible in a conflict-free manner. So now, you know, this is just a naive follow the gap. And again, it's a simple heuristic. Our goal is to actually come up with something at the end of the day that's very simple, very fast, and also very agile. So given this distance threshold as shown, you know, in the blue circle, we notice that the largest gap is basically straight ahead. We have obstacle on the left side, obstacle on the right side, and straight ahead, we see about two, at least two beams are going through, right? So. And th that has a couple of consecutive points, you know, outside this distance threshold over here. So they qualify as, you know, a path for us to choose. And so what we want to do is basically just pick the midpoint of that, right? Unfortunately, this obstacle on the left side is tilted at an angle in such a way that, you know, as we steer through this midpoint and this gap and doing so the car crashes with this left, left obstacle. So this is a subtle example and the algorithm does not work yet, right? So, so the idea of seeking out the largest gap actually works perfectly fine with polynomial robots like turtle bots and you know, which are bots that can have omnidirectional wheels. Oh, and a good thing about these bots are that they can turn 360 degrees in place and also works for non-holonomic robots like the F110 as long as the environments uh, you know, ha are, have the obstacles that are just sparsely distributed, right? It's not a very cluttered environment. So as a side note, you know, what is this holonomic versus non-holonomic refers to robots ability to directly move towards a target versus having to reposition itself before moving directly to the target. So as an example, you know, think of a car in a parking lot, right? If you've parked a car in a particular parking spot, and you want to move it to the next parking spot, you would need to first back out of this spot and then pull into the next spot because you cannot just slide the car directly into the spot next to you. So that's considered non-holonomic. Right? And the best way to do a qualitative check with, of, on holonomy versus non-holonomy is that you look at the robot and its operating space. And if you can find two positions not blocked by an obstacle, 
but the robot will need to reposition itself before directly moving to that goal position, then it's non-holonomic. So formally, holonomy refers to a restriction or not among the transitional axes, right? If a robot is holonomic with respect to n dimensions, it's capable of moving in any direction in those n physical dimensions available to it. And if it's holonomic, then it's restricted to which dimension it can move in, right? So our car has Ackerman steering and that's non-holonomic or simpler robots have, you know, uh, racing robots have uh, skid steer and they are non-holonomic too. They can't get to any point uh, necessarily directly. Some points they have to basically reposition and then they can get to directly. So how does this tie back to our problem over here is that when we have certain obstacles, uh, we need to basically take care of them because we cannot directly avoid them. We might have to steer away from them and that steering away takes some time and effort. Uh, and in that process, we might crash into them. So this approach of follow the gap doesn't actively account for the safety as it doesn't consider the car's dimensions, right? The car can hit the edge of this uh, because the car is so wide, right? So. Finally, it's very difficult to decide this distance threshold that we have T as it changes based on how densely populated or how sparsely populated your map is in a cluttered environment where you have to do small maneuvers to get out, you're not going to have such a generous T. And so you, the problem is that in a race, you can't dynamically change this threshold in a, in a, in a sort of a smart way so far, right? So, so one way to calculate these affordances of how much space I need to keep, you know, on the left side, right side of, of my robot, and, and so I don't crash into an obstacle uh, is, uh, you know, so that our robot can pass through these obstacles. So say here we have this robot uh, that needs, that's in yellow, that needs to pass through these two obstacles. You want to make sure that it does not hit any one of them, right? So, so we can represent our robot and these ob and obstacles, even though we have a race car, all as circles, right? To make it generic and because you can always find a big enough circle that encloses your obstacle or a robot conservatively. So this robot circle defines a footprint with radius R rob. And uh, what we would like to do is for our robot to go between these two obstacles, each of which have their own radius as well. Right? So a very useful conversion in robotics is to translate into configuration space, everything, right? So the robot, by inflating the radius of each of these obstacles by the radius of the robot. Then when we get the equivalent representation where my robot is now just a point, as we see on the right-hand side, uh, but all the obstacles now appear inflated by this radius of the robot itself. Meaning that if I can get my point representation to go in between these two obstacles, I'm guaranteeing that my robot will not physically collide with you know, the, the true obstacles because I'm ensuring that I'm clearing the obstacles by at least a radius of the robot itself. Okay, so the robot gets reduced to a point when these obstacles are inflated. Now we can apply that you know, concept to our follow the gap problem. So what's it? Step one, right? So to find the, uh, the nearest LiDAR point and put a safety bubble you know, of radius RB around it. So already notice the difference now we're not looking optimistically at, you know, where's the furthest uh, 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 LiDAR point away from us, but instead first we're looking pessimistically at, you know, the closest LiDAR point to us, which represents the closest obstacle we could hit. Put a safety bubble, you know, RB around it, and then notice that it's, that's the closest point in the hit array, right? So that's 3.1, for example, in this array. And then, all the points that are, you know, inside of the safety bubble of, you know, we set their distance to zero. We basically zero out those portions that basically say that, okay, now we have an obstacle right there. We're not going to consider that as part of our range uh, array anymore, right? So all the non-zero points now are considered free space. That's, you can drive over it. And everything in all other directions represented by this LiDAR array is considered a valid steering direction. Next, we find the minimum length sequence of consecutive non-zeros, right? And among these, <clears throat> essentially these points, we find the max gap. So the maximum length sequence of you know, cons consecutive non-zeros, and that's on the right side. That's where we have this max gap. And it's essentially the widest gap away from you know, this pessimistic part. So we are, now we move to the optimistic part. Um, 
And, and that shows us everything on the right side is where it's open. And now we would essentially just want to figure out, you know, how to get, say, to the center of that max gap. And then we basically set our steering angle to that point, and then we drive over there full speed, right? And uh, so that's a simple algorithm over here. We're just eliminating, you know, any the closest, you know, obstacles and then going towards the max gap over there. So we find the best point among this maximum length sequence. And as far, you know, and, and so far what we have been doing is just go towards that midpoint. So naive improvement over that is to choose the furthest point, you know, in the free space among all the free space choices that you have. So find the max gap area and then set your steering angle towards it and then go towards the far point. So, but a big issue in, is that this results in, you know, frequently changing our directions with every update. I'm saying, okay, now go here, now go there. Now there. And we keep, we keep adjusting our speed and this results in basically losing a lot of velocity quickly. And, and also like a very skittish behavior of this because it's just reacting at every stage. And yeah, you can use some kind of filtering method, but you know, what's a simpler way to achieve that, right? So, I mean, the basic idea is that, you know, if, if the, obstacle is you know three or four meters away should you really take an immediate sharp turn to avoid it um, probably not because it's relatively far away uh, what you would probably want to do is you know smoothly curve into the gap or curve away from the obstacle over a period you know of three to four meters that right so over that distance so the key takeaways from this very very simple algorithm you know uh, is is that first of all it's you know immediately more pessimistic than the initial, you know, uh, follow the, find the gap heuristic. And that's, you know, that said, optimistically find the largest gap, drive towards it. So now, unlike what we are, you know, we're not encoding the dimensions of the car, you know, within the safety bubble, you know, a good radius for the safety bubble is just over a width of the car, right? So, uh, and since we are encoding that information, we are explicitly telling the algorithm to avoid the closest obstacle, which is represented by that red point. Um, we're trying to uh, clear it by a certain margin. And then, and that's natural, you know, as having a fixed threshold T, uh, we're going to do this. As, so as the car approaches this obstacle over time, more of its LIDAR points are going to be concentrated around this obstacle. And this sort of say, this safety threshold would correspondingly start getting bigger because it's, we are getting closer. So already we are seeing that we are dynamically varying the size of the safety bubble as we move towards the obstacle. And although the radius stays constant in the world coordinates as the car gets closer, then it finally, um, you know, we can also implement this, you know, very efficiently as a fast algorithm. So now let's look at once this car clears these obstacles, you see as it goes through this corridor now, it starts to wobble quite a bit, right? And it's very slow. It's, it's quite also uncertain and tentative in its movements. So this wobble is something that we want to take care of because at the end of the day, we're not just trying to traverse some you know, system. We, are, we want to compete in a race and we want to you know, compete to win. So let's look at a, a variation of you know, the follow the gap, which is also a very small variation, but it, it was very successful. And this was suggested and implemented by the University of North Carolina team. Uh, and they actually were uh, winners of the 2019 autonomous racing competition that was held in Montreal in Canada. So let's look at what the, their uh, approach was. So the simple goal was, was basically to find the furthest point and go there. But as you can imagine, that's not always going to work. So you might want to go to the furthest distance, and but then you're going to hit a wall along the way. So, so first we look for disparities, right? This would be anywhere where there is a wall blocking a reading. So you have consecutive angles of the LIDAR giving you very different numbers, right? So this indicates that there, there were, must be something blocked, and then we have a clear path after that. So in this case, we have a disparity where we see 2.2 meters and then 4.8 meters. So that's a big jump uh, uh, between uh, these LIDAR uh, scan uh, points over here, right? So, so we take that to mean that maybe this is turning a corner and that's the path that we want to take if there is no disparity because that's uh, because you have a smooth wall and it's not sufficient, you know, uh, as much to consider the, you know, the vehicle size only, right? So. Uh, the next step is basically to then extend the disparity to overwriting these LIDAR readings now equal to the car's width plus some tolerance at the disparity point. So essentially, we just overwrite, say, 
uh, we have 2.2 and then 4.8 and we just overwrite 4.8 and perhaps even 4.9 to 2.2 we just lower them back to where that obstacle is and, and allow uh, <clears throat> that disparity but then after that we leave the, the values as is so this is similar to our rb that we spoke about before right so so, so now we essentially have have you know canceled a few or reduced a, a few lidar scans to be that are close to the the disparity portion, uh, and then we can basically have the free space on the right side. So what we did was that we took these disparities and effectively moved them out from the wall to kind of extend the range of the wall. Right. So, uh, so now we can only pass through safe positions. And this means that you can take out a number of, ang of the angles that correspond to the distance of the width of the car, as, and, and we're going to extend a circle, uh, and then we're going to cut off the LiDAR readings, right? So we're effectively working with some virtual LiDAR readings at this point. So <clears throat> based on these virtual LiDAR readings, you know, as you can see in my very shaky drawing right at the top of this uh, image on the right, that indicates the path that we actually are going to treat you know, as a free space to move around. Now we don't have to worry about the size of the car anymore using this figure you know, as we drive towards a first distance. And that's the direction we're gonna travel in. So we make uh, local decisions and we're pretty confident that this is closely approximates you know, um, something that is in the, uh, re uh, related to the global optimal shortage path. Uh, let's see how, how far that goes. Though. So here's an example of a race now uh, uh, of how this car basically used this you know, disparity extender. And you can see the car is confidently driving through this racetrack and, and it's going at a really good speed, has minimum wobble over there as it's going through. And this was the way that this car was able to you know, clock in the fastest lap time using this disparity extender. And it beat uh, many other solutions that you know used map-based solutions at that time because it was also very fast to respond and react to uh, between the lidar scans. And uh, this was also a simulator that their team built just to analyze, you know, based on the lidar scans, you know, how this disparity extender would actually work in uh, any arbitrary kind of racing pattern because they did not know what the shape of the track would be before they came to race uh, in Montreal. So a couple of details over here, like this is a greedy algorithm. So we might not be always be making the you know, most optimal decisions, but we are close to the best case because as we choose our speed based on the distance. So we have a piecewise linear function to determine the speed based on the furthest distance. This approach also has very quick processing, right? If you have a 40 hertz LiDAR update rate, that's 25 milliseconds between updates, so we need to keep our processing under 10 milliseconds. And in this implementation, it took about you know, eight milliseconds. So you got to keep that in mind too. Uh, so that's why we are really keen to keep it simple. And so this slide just summarizes so far you know, what this disparity extender is. Again, you can see a small tweak on follow the gap, but these small tweaks actually go a long way. So it removed the wobble and also helped us increase the speed just by changing how we define uh, what is a gap, right? And, and, and what is an obstacle? So uh, we can see the disparity extender now on this obstacle course. And here you're going to see that, you know, people are going to be throwing boxes at the car, opening boxes suddenly, and, and as it drives through this, and, and it's very agile as it's going through this, this course like that, right? So, and uh, it's, it's only, uh, these obstacles are not in known positions and it is just, you know, adaptive uh, as it drives through. And uh, this is a very fun video uh, of showing how this disparity extender also worked for head-to-head uh, you know, -head racing. So it basically is treating the other car as a static obstacle. And now it's trying not to hit it and trying to find a way in and around it, right? And here you do see a lot more wobble from this first person view because it keeps seeing the other car as an obstacle and then it's trying to figure out like on the left side, right side, and then it almost hits the other car. And here it actually crashes into the other car but recovers very well. And, and so this made a very, very you know, aggressive uh, opponent for the race. And in the end, uh, this car was you know, started to drift uh, and then it eventually was able to overtake the opponent uh, and successfully win the competition. So, and you are gonna be able to do the same thing you know, in a couple of weeks. 
All right. So let's get back to, you know, now, uh, although this algorithm, you know, works, you know, adequately for the, for the width of the car, we need to tack on one additional constraint to make sure that the, the rear of the car doesn't strike a corner or the passing car like we saw in the video, right? So when you make a turn, so we handle this case in a simple manner that simply assumes that whatever the obstacle is at the side of the car is not moving towards the car, right? So, so the tweak is like this. Scan all the available LiDAR samples below 90 degrees and above 90 degrees. And these will cover basically the sides of the car to the back, right? At any point in, you know, within the safe distance of the car in the direction of the car is turning. Suppose I'm turning to my left. Then if we do see uh, an obstacle over there, then stop turning and just keep going straight for a bit more than that, right? So it's basically saying ignore uh, this algorithm for a short period of time because you don't want to strike that obstacle right now. So, so under some situations, we have found some very funny behavior also here is that the car will actually try to perform a U-turn and specifically a U-turn appears in situations like the following, right? So where we are, uh, the car is on the inside track of a wide portion of the track. And you can see the track is pretty wide on the right-hand side, and but it must turn into the narrower portion of the track. So the problem occurs because as the car approaches the turn, it will be able to see some reachable path into the turn. Uh, but uh, however, the paths will be much shorter, you know, on the left side into the turn than onto the white part of the track in the part of the track where the car is already. So the so basically the car should see the correct path and move you know forward slightly more, right? So but essentially what happens is that the car now sees a wider path on the right hand side, and then it it it's basically goes in the opposite direction of where the track is heading towards, right? So uh, how about by as this car is going forward, you know it it, it might it, and it starts to turn to the right hand side, it may have turned too much leaving the correct path you know, of the car behind it on the left-hand side rather than you know, uh, to the right or left of it if it was going straight ahead, right? So this issue shouldn't occur with a uniform width track because any portion of the track that the car must turn towards will always be the same width as the portion of the track the car is already on, right? So uh, the opposite wall of the current portion of the track will never be the furthest distance away. So let's take a look at, at this video over here that shows you, you know, how this car actually does this loop. So the first lap this car does, no problems at all. It's doing it confidently like we've seen in the previous videos and it does a lap well. So now over here, Nathan who is standing right over there is going to actually block the, you know, this race path of the, of the car. And so now the car basically uh, gets into this problem where it spins around and ironically, it spins around again. I can tell you why it spun around the first time with the explanation I gave you, but why it spun around the second time, that's still a puzzle to us. But essentially, it just, just shows you that these reactive algorithms can have some strange quirks, right? And, and it's repeatable also over here. All right, so, <clears throat> so here is you know, a fourth tweak, and that's to help you minimize this wiggle problem, right? So the main Issue with the follow the gap, you know, is this wiggle problem where the robot, you know, keeps turning left and right and running in this S shape as if it's not sure which direction it should go in and it keeps kind of oscillating, right? So these, those robots have this problem because they have, you know, set their direction to the deepest range, right? And we have a rectangular track. So here's an example to explain, you know, what, why this wiggle actually happens, right? So to show, like, let's look at the figure on the left first. When the LiDAR is located at the left of the track at point A, the right-hand corner has the deepest range. And then the robot sets the direction to that right corner. And then when the, and, and starts to move in that towards the right-hand side. And then when the LiDAR is located on the right part of the track, the left-hand corner has the deepest range. And therefore the robot starts to change its direction, you know, between the left and the right corner as it's moving in that, right? So, so the robot will move in this shape and it keeps S shape because it keeps, because it does not have a, it has a discontinuous destination. So the wiggling problem will get more serious when the robot approaches these corners also because the angle difference between those two corners gets larger, right? So one suggestion is to basically set a limit, say a threshold of two meters or three meters 
and then follow the center of the deepest gap instead of the deepest say, picking a single direction we basically say well everything is far out over here we just pick the center of that like we see on the right hand side figure so draw a circle with the radius of the threshold select the center point on that curve as a current destination now no matter what the lidar locus point a or point b this center point should be similar with changes you know and will change continuously you know while the robot moves but only slightly right so so the in the races where we have this curve track you may not see this wiggling as much right but you will see this in the corridor that you're going to be testing out your vehicles in and so that brings us to the race one which you will do after this uh, this lab and you will compete with all your uh, classmates and essentially now it's not about just being able to complete a lap and avoid obstacles but it's how fast you can do that right so there's a performance aspect to it and just to show you this is done very successfully in the cpsv grand prix in 2017 or so and you will have to complete five laps without crashing and you will get penalties for crashing in each lap right so it's only single car you're not going to be driving head to head yet that will be in the follow on race or, and then, you know, in, in the following, towards the end of the semester, we'll have lots of projects. This is an example of a project done by a student, Dhruv Karthik. And it's essentially, you know, using imitation learning, building on follow the gap, but now using that as a part of the training data to basically drive through, you know, cluttered uh, corridors. But the training is done on a LIDAR and a camera only. And then the inferencing is done only with the camera. So this is in some sense, you can think of it as a way of getting to as a mono depth with your camera and uh, and then you can just use a cheap uh, camera uh, and and then reduce the cost of the car so only the training is done with an expensive lidar and here you can see that after a few uh, training uh, events it's able to navigate this corridor very well this is just to give you an idea that you know while we are learning the physics based you know uh, uh, dynamical approaches for follow the gap and reactive methods they will get you to some learning based methods down the line right so so here are the key takeaways right so follow the gap is simple and effective for single vehicle driving once you set up the basic framework a few tweaks you know and i gave you four different tweaks so that will improve the robustness and the speed and uh, these reactive methods can race very well as you've seen in a bunch of these videos so with uh, <clears throat> how would you do this in the lab? So we give you the lab handout on the left-hand side and we'll hand that out to you too. Uh, and then here's a snippet of the code uh, using the F110 uh, OpenAI gym environment. So essentially first you got to choose your drivers, right? You can have multiple drivers. We're only going to have one driver for this lab. And this driver you need to define is using the, follow the gap follower uh, driving policy for that, right? So, and other drivers later in the semester could be using different types of uh, path planning and navigation policies. Then you, below that, you basically select the racetrack. We'll pick the Spielberg racetrack from Austria, for example. And then you need to <clears throat> start, you know, load the map, start the gym environment, put the vehicles essentially into their start positions, right? Because later on, when we have multiple vehicles, we want to sort of keep them separate and Essentially, you want to specify the pose of each of the vehicles at the initialization point. Okay, so now the setup is done. You know, we are ready to uh, run this code. And this is the main while loop that we have uh, coming up over here. And uh, essentially, uh, this, is, this function over here will uh, run for two laps and, and then exit if you're successful in navigating these two laps. Your main goal for this lab is to implement this, you know, uh, a process LIDAR function, which takes in the LIDAR values, calculates the max gap, and then find the direction in which you go. And basically you've got to uh, output the steering angle and the speed at every time step to have a smooth navigation. And this is an example of the lab. So here you can see the car in purple is navigating this course. And we have added a lot of obstacles along the path and uh, some are continuous obstacles, some are in the middle of the path, like over here. So you have to choose either to go on the left side or the right side. And here you can see that the car is smoothly going along this track. And uh, the, the key aspect over here is that it's able to avoid all these different types of obstacles. And even when the path is kind of slightly you know, uh, <clears throat> constrained uh, or when the curve is constrained over here, right? so you want to make sure that 
you can navigate this track uh, and do successful laps and also be able to understand where, say in this case, is coming to a cluttered portion where we have some irregularity in where the obstacles are placed. And finally, it has to also go through this kind of, you know, uh, narrower tunnel kind of uh, portion of the track. And that's all just stress testing the parameters that you have picked over here. And uh, it completes the lab successfully, right? So this just gives you an idea of what your, you know, lab will consider. And then we can test it on, you know, different kind of track with different kind of obstacle distributions like that. So here are a couple of uh, references uh, for where, where we learned about follow the gap and implemented it. And, uh, and you can read through these if you want to know more about it, right? So I'll just spend a very few minutes just talking about other reactive methods. And as we'll see, they are good to know, but they're not that useful yet uh, for what we're doing, but it's just a good idea to know how do these reactive methods work, right? So bug algorithms, these are from the mid nineties, you know, there's no global model of, you know, where in the world obstacles are, but you can see it still safely navigates towards its goal position. And it's only using local knowledge, right? But the one thing that it needs is it just needs to know where the global goal is for that, right? And this, uh, there are variations of this bug, bug algorithm, bug one, bug zero, bug one. And this is the one we are showing here is a tangent bug. And that basically uses, you know, range measurements from the LIDAR. And so essentially this bug algorithm has two modes of motion, right? Move in a straight line when the goal is, you know, when the path to the goal is unobstructed. And essentially we have our LIDAR range, let's say it's 10 meters. And if I don't hit an obstacle in the shortest path towards my destination, towards my goal, then I basically just go in that direction. But if I do hit a wall along that, then I need to basically follow the wall boundary like that, right? So, in the nine rays that are shown over here, the blue ray basically is showing the unobstructed way towards the goal. So it's just saying go towards that goal and don't worry about you know, uh, any obstacles as of now. And, and it's heading there because as far as this LIDAR can see, it's an un unobstructed way. Uh, but then when it hits a wall, as we see on the right-hand side, uh, then you know it's obstructed. So then it essentially switches to the part two, which says follow the wall. And then it has a heuristic to follow which direction of the wall so that it can get closer to the goal uh, by and by. Right? So, and uh, essentially this just defines a way in which it is always trying to greedily get closer and clo closer to the goal and uh, try to minimize, you know, essentially this, this sum of, uh, my direct path to the goal and then my indirect path towards the goal. And you can see that this actually works really well for, you know, for uh, curved obstacles. And uh, essentially it is always skimming the boundary of these obstacles to get closer to the goal. And uh, there are a couple of disadvantages, you know, these are prone to taking long trajectories and uh, uh, because, uh, you know, it's just making local greedy decisions. Uh, and sometimes it does get very close but you know there's no there's no path to get towards that right so and uh, and even if we let some local point in the lidar scan we still need you know another heuristic to figure out where the goal point should be right we have to keep calculating our distance to the goal point so we need some way of localizing where we are with respect to that goal and that may not be easy to do unless we have a map uh, so <clears throat> So another uh, variation is basically these uh, artificial potential fields. So here we can see a robot navigating towards a goal, but it has to go through a cluttered reagent of many obstacles. And the main concept here, this approach is to build a function that attracts the robot towards the goal and repels it from each of the obstacles. And you can see that how it's getting repelled very well, uh, but it's still heading towards its goal, which is at the origin and it navigates this expertly in this direction. Uh, as long as there is a path, you know, in, in this greedy uh, direction. So the basic idea of, you know, this artificial potential fields is uh, that you can think of it as placing an electromagnetic field over the environment. And, you know, the robot uh, here uh, starts at Q start and it's making its way towards Q goal. And we attach positive charges to the obstacle boundaries and the robot is also positively charged. And we attach a negative charge towards our goal, right? So, and basically this gives us a potential field that can be expressed as a sum of this attraction and repulsion forces over here. And <clears throat> a 
uh, one way in which these uh, environments are navigated is essentially you know, using a, a gradient descent approach, which works in a very iterative manner. It computes the negative gradient you know, at the new point as it takes a step in that direction and so on and so forth. And the institution behind is that every behind every step is that the gradient of the function gives you the direction that increases the function the most. So by taking a small step in the opposite direction, we can hope to make the function decrease uh, at each iteration. So we basically get closer to the goal. Now this word increase or decrease, it depends on you know, how you're orienting your problem, whether you want, but here we want to basically decrease the distance as this attraction function. And a common problem with a lot of these uh, you know, approaches is that uh, they, they basically have this existence of a local minima, right? In the potential function. And these points, you know, uh, where the repulsive force equals the attractive force in a, and basically gives you a zero overall force. To escape this, uh, you know, we can basically add, you know, we can add an escape for force at the point of a local minima, uh, which drives this robot away from it. So when it gets stuck, it basically has this, this escape force. Sometimes the cavities are too deep and the escape force is not strong enough to push the robot away from the local minima. It's still trying to get towards it, but there's a wall in between. Uh, so by increasing the force applied to the local minima every time, you know, failed attempt uh, finds a solution, in an attempt to find a solution, we can escape even deep cavities because we're increasing this escape force, right? So under these modifications, you know, uh, these uh, uh, potential fields can be used to find suboptimal paths in a short time in even complex environments. And you can think on one side, you know, we want a provably, uh, you know, efficient or optimal path and then the other side, we just want something that is very simple and works, even though it may be suboptimal. <clears throat> and it's, it's a choice that you have to make depending on your problem. All right, so the main takeaway from these alternate algorithms are that you know, most of these require some notion of a global goal, which we don't actually have on a racetrack. Imagine you start moving away from the start point, but you have to get back to the start point. So the car will just turn around, right? So we don't have that mentality because we have a loop now in our in our world, right? So the front end follow the gap, you know, implicitly encodes this global goal because it's just moving it along the track and then it can come back to the start point, which may be a good or bad thing because it's limited to this kind of environment, right? So, so you should try your own thing for the race one and you have the base code outlining the algorithm and you can get ready to start racing right from this lab now.